Hello and welcome. My name is Nathan Lake. I'm a member of the Church of Christ on West Main Street in Medford, Oregon. I want to welcome you to our program entitled The Bible Today. And we've entitled it that because we believe firmly that the Bible is just as relevant today as it was at its completion 2,000 years ago. I hope that you'll join me in a few moments when we begin our series entitled Why I Trust the Bible. When the breezes blow, when the breezes blow, blows the snow, autumn leaves make way for a blanket frosty white. When the songbird sings, When the breezes blow, when the breezes blow, when the breezes blow. There was a Bible translation society who had made it their aim to translate the scriptures into every known language in the entire world. This presents many problems as they attempt to do it, and one of the problems that they had was when they came upon a group of people who had no word for faith, no word for trust. And after some time of, of trying to really define the word to them, they finally, when they translated trust or faith, they translated into these words, to put your full weight down upon. And so when the Bible said when someone believes or when someone trusts the gospel, they would say when someone puts their full weight down upon the gospel. That's important to our study because I believe the Bible to be the Word of God Himself. I believe it came directly from His lips and His mind. That being as it is, I trust it. And when I say I trust it, I like that definition. I am willing to put the full weight of my life upon it. Now here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying I'm perfect and I follow it perfectly. I don't know anybody who does. I am a sinner in need of a Savior and everybody else sins as well. But what I'm saying is that when I want to get my life on track, this is where I turn. This is where I'm willing to put the full weight of my life above all else. We're beginning a series. And in this series, we'll have three lessons. The first today will be, I trust its historical accuracy. Next will be, I trust its author. And thirdly, I trust its advice or its commands. Now, as I do these lessons, understand that my primary aim is not to force anyone into believing what I believe. I know what I believe and I am completely engrossed in the subject, and I enjoy sharing it. And if as I'm sharing it, you find that you agree with me, well, that's just the icing on the cake. Today we'll begin with the lesson, I Trust the Bible's Historical Accuracy. And I'm going to give you five reasons why I do. Number one, I believe it's been accurately transmitted. Number two, it has excellent integrity. Number three, it has been corroborated by outside sources. Number four, because it passes the acid test of good journalism, and we'll talk about what that is. And then five, because of the dedication of its writers. Let's begin with that first point. I believe that the Bible has been accurately transmitted. What that means is, I believe that we have an accurate rendering of what was originally written. Now, what we don't have is the original writings themselves. We don't have the autographs. We don't have the original papyrus on which Matthew penned his gospel. We don't have the clay tablets to which Moses put his stylus and wrote his books. What we have are hand copies, and as a matter of fact, what we have are copies of copies of copies. And someone might look at that at first and say, well, since we don't have the originals, how can we even know what was originally written? It's interesting that we also don't have the original writings of Plato. 
We don't have the original writings of Aristotle or Homer or many of the other classical histories, and yet we accept readily that we have an accurate rendering of what they originally wrote, and we do. There are sciences applied to these sort of things when we have a document from history that we want to verify. Those sciences have been applied to those writings and they've been found to be accurate. Now, how this applies to the scriptures is that the exact same tests that were applied to Aristotle and Homer and these others applied to the scriptures show us that the scriptures pass pass these tests even better than the classical histories. So, on whatever basis we're going to accept the classical histories, we need to accept the Bible as well. Now, let's not overstate the case. This doesn't prove its truthfulness. This doesn't prove the Bible's historical accuracy. All it shows us is that we do have what was originally written. And that's just point number one. Number two, the Bible has excellent integrity. By integrity, what we mean is that it does not contradict itself. And this is really amazing when you look at what the Bible is. The Bible is not one book. It's actually a library. It's a collection of books that are all put together to tell one story. We have 66 books telling one story through about 40 writers over a span of 1,500 years, even more than that. And these writers came from different backgrounds. Some were kings, some were homeless people, some were shepherds, all adding their part to this story, and yet there is not one contradiction in the whole thing. That's amazing to me. That's why I don't just say it has integrity. I think it has excellent integrity. Now, when I say it has zero contradictions, let's remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about historical accuracy. And what I'm saying is it has no historical, not philosophical or theological contradictions. I know that there are a lot of contradictions or supposed contradictions of a theological or of a philosophical nature that have been raised. And the truth is that every one of those has been answered, but we certainly don't have time to go through all of them on a program like this. Historically, there are zero contradictions. And again, we don't want to overstate the case as we go through. This still does not prove that the Bible is historically accurate. It doesn't prove that it's true. It shows simply that it does not contradict itself. What do we know so far? We have an accurate rendering of what was originally written and there are no contradictions of an historical nature in it. Point number three. I believe, I trust, the historical accuracy of the Scripture because it has been corroborated by outside sources. And when we talk about outside sources, we're talking about things like archaeology. Over the last couple of hundred years since archaeology has really been put together as a science, hundreds upon hundreds of artifacts have been unearthed that reflect on biblical statements. And yet there is not one contradiction between a biblical statement and an archaeological discovery. It doesn't exist. And what that tells me is that archaeology supports the Bible's claims. Not only that, we have contemporary historians. Now you know what a contemporary is. I'm your contemporary. We're living in the same period of time. Well, there were historians writing their histories at the same times that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were writing theirs. And whenever they speak of the same people, the same places, the same events, they're all in general agreement. And so contemporary historians, as well as archaeology, back up the biblical record. It evidently didn't even occur to the writers of the time to deny what was being written and circulated by the biblical writers. Again, when they spoke of the same people, places, and events, they were in general agreement. And so the biblical accounts agree with history. And so I trust it to be historically accurate. Number four, 
as we said, it passes the test of what I've heard called the acid test of good journalism. And when we talk about the acid test of journalism, what we're saying is that, and here, by the way, we're specifically speaking of the New Testament books, the books from Matthew to Revelation. The acid test of good journalism says that it was written during the lifetime of its subjects. And that's very important because it was written and circulated among those about whom it spoke, people who were present at the events that were recorded. And so there were people who could have written down their own account and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that didn't really happen. And yet we have zero disagreement from those who could actually disprove it. And so in my mind, it passes the test, the acid test of good journalism. You see, the people that were alive at the time and could refute it, didn't. You don't have any writings from first century people who say that didn't really happen if they were there. What you do have, quite often, is a man perhaps with a Ph.D. or something like that who stands in front of a group of people and says, your Bible isn't accurate. Let me tell you what really happened. After all, I should know I have a Ph.D. and I wasn't there. Now, let's be honest here. The man can't even tell you if I put on clean socks this morning. He wasn't there. He has to rely on the same thing we do, which is the accounts of those who were there. And again, it didn't occur to the people living at the time to deny it. And so it is undisputed by its subjects. Finally, point number five. I believe in the historical accuracy of the Bible because of the dedication of its writers. And again here, we are mainly speaking of the New Testament books. The writers who wrote these books lived martyrs' lives. Listen to something that was said by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 27. He says, Five times I received thirty-nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. He's talking about the hardships that he went through specifically for the things written in these books. The writers not only lived martyrs' lives, but they went to martyrs' deaths. The Apostle Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was put to death with having his head chopped off under Nero. Stephen was put to death with a sword. And none of the biblical writers ever recanted, even in the face of death and torture. Somebody says, well, maybe they were just insane. Maybe they were just crazy people who saw, thought they saw something that they didn't. The problem with that hypothesis is that their writings reveal a grasp of logic and reason that will not allow for that conclusion. Reasonable men wrote and died for these books. Why do I trust the historical accuracy of the Bible? Because I know I have the original writings because it does not contradict itself, because it agrees with history, because it's undisputed by its subjects, and because it was written and attested to by reasonable men. And so I believe that it's reasonable to trust, to put my full weight down upon this book. I invite you to join me next time when we begin the next study in our series entitled, Why I Trust the Author of the Bible. God bless you as you seek His will in His Word. Welcome back. In our last lesson, we talked about the historical accuracy of the Bible in our series, Why I Trust the Bible. I trust its historical accuracy. Today's lesson is entitled, Why I Trust the Author of the Bible. Now, this will be a two-part lesson. We will look at part one today and part two in our next lesson. And we'll be recapping some from our previous lesson as well. Now when we talk about trust, let's remember the definition that we're operating on. 
When I say trust, what I mean is to put your full weight down upon. And so when I say I trust the Bible, I'm saying that I am willing to put the full weight of my life down upon the Bible. Again, that doesn't mean that I think I do it perfectly or that I think I'm better than anyone else. What it simply means is the Bible is where I turn when I need answers in my life because I trust it. Putting our trust in the Bible should mean putting our trust in God. Because the Bible claims many times to be the Word of God. And if the Bible is the Word of God, then trusting His Word will mean trusting the Bible. Now we're going to approach this systematically, beginning with the New Testament books and establishing Jesus' authority as the Son of God, moving from there to show that the Bible is the Word of God, and we will base that upon the authority of Jesus to say so. We'll be looking at five points here as we go through. Number one, we will see that the Bible claims to be historically accurate. And remember, we're beginning with the New Testament, so we'll begin by saying the New Testament claims to be historically accurate. Second, if it makes the claim, we must test the claim, and so we will go over what we did last time, testing the New Testament for historical accuracy. Third, we must accept the implications of historical accuracy. Fourth, we will examine the deeds and the claims of Jesus. And fifth, we will see that Jesus, the Son of God, tells us the Bible is the Word of God. Let's begin with point one. The New Testament makes a claim in several places to be historically accurate. One of these places is Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And Luke says this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the exact truth of the things that you've been taught. Now, this tells us that Luke claims to be writing down an accurate record of things that really happened for this man Theophilus to whom he was writing. We find another similar claim in John chapter 19 and verse 35. John here speaks of his own writing and he says, He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows he's telling the truth so that you also may believe. And so John claims to be writing down eyewitness testimony of things that he has actually seen. In other words, accurate history. Now we know that just because someone claims to be writing accurate history doesn't necessarily mean that they are. We're not going to overstate the case and say that because they say it's true, it must be true. These things must be tested and verified. And that's what we did briefly in our last lesson. If you remember, we tested the New Testament for its historical accuracy. And we saw that it had been accurately transmitted. And what that means is that we have written down in front of us the same thing that was originally written. We looked at the internal evidence and we saw that it has excellent integrity. And that means that it does not have any historical contradictions or inaccuracies within the text. And then we looked at external evidences like archaeology and we saw that there are no archaeological discoveries that disagree with biblical statements. And we looked at contemporary historians, those who were writing their histories at the same time as the New Testament writers. And we see there that whenever they talk about the same events, people, places, they're in general agreement. We looked at what we called the acid test of journalism. And that said that the New Testament documents were written within the lifetime of the people that they spoke of. And so there were people living at the time that could corroborate or deny what was written in those books. And when we see the writings of those people, we see that they actually corroborate it. And then we talked about the martyrdom of the writers that the people who wrote the New Testament believed sincerely that what they were writing was the truth, and they would know. They lived martyrs' lives, and they went to martyrs' deaths for what was in those documents. And so as we looked through all of that, we saw, or at least I am convinced, 
that what is written in these documents is historically accurate. Now, it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to accept the implications of historical accuracy. If a document is found to be historically accurate, then what that means is, if it says someone said something, they said it. If it says something happened, it happened. That is, after all, what we rely on history books to tell us. So what if it said someone walked on the water? What if it says someone healed the sick? What if it says that someone brought the dead back to life with a word? Would we automatically discount it because we don't believe those sorts of things happen? There's an important, important point here. We don't decide whether or not we believe in the supernatural based upon whether or not we believe in the supernatural. We decide it the same way we decide everything else, by the evidence. And if it's recorded in reliable historical documents, then I'm ready to believe that it actually happened. And so we can examine the deeds and the claims of Jesus, knowing without a doubt that He did what it says He did, and He claimed what it says He claimed. Take, for example, Mark chapter 2. We'll look at Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together, so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. Now, if we say that a historically accurate document, when it says something happened, it happened, then when it says this happened, it happened. When it says someone said something, they said it. Then when it says someone said something, they said it. And so we have Jesus here making a claim to be able to forgive sins and supposedly proving that claim by telling the man to get up and walk. We see another such example in John chapter 11. Now in John 11, Jesus raises a dead man named Lazarus. In verses 1 through 4, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Come down to verse 11. It says, This he said, and after, he, after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. In verse 17 it says, So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. And so Lazarus was dead, and he was claiming he was going to wake him from the dead. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again, verse 23. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And then in verses 38 through 44, Jesus walks up to the tomb, says, Lazarus, come forth. And the man that was bound comes forth, back to life. 
Now, if this is recorded in historically accurate documents, then it really happened, bottom line. Now, you're just going to have to decide if you accept it as historically accurate or not. I do. Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins, raise the dead, and give eternal life. He claimed to be the Son of God. And then He raised the dead. And He healed the sick with a word. Based upon these things, I have believed myself that He is the Son of God, just as He claimed. Now, in our final point, Jesus, the Son of God, tells us that the Bible is the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus points back to a statement made by Adam. And what's interesting is He says that God made the statement. He quotes from the book of Genesis, and he says that it was God who made the statement. In other words, no matter who it was that actually wrote it down, he says God is the actual author of that Old Testament book. When we come to the New Testament books, we see Jesus making promises to His disciples. Back here in the book of John, chapter 14, verses 23 through 26. Jesus tells His disciples, the men who would eventually give us the New Testament, that the Holy Spirit was going to come and He was going to teach them all things directly from God. Then in chapter 15, verses 26 through 27, He says that they would speak the same things in this world that Jesus Himself spoke. Continuing to speak to them in chapter 16, verses 12 through 13, he says that they would be guided into all the truth that God had to deliver. And then in chapter 17 and verse 8 and down into verses 17 and 20, he said that our belief in Him is to be based upon their word. Now that's an important point because there's only one place that you can find the authentic word that is, the writings of the apostles themselves, and that is in the New Testament. Now, when you come over to 2 Thessalonians, and we look at chapter 2 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now, in case any of you didn't get the memo, there are no 2,000-year-old apostles walking around today. They've all passed away. And so the way this would read specifically to us is that we are to hold fast to the traditions which we were taught by letter from them. What we have in this book, Old Testament and New Testament, is the Word of God passed through men, penned onto paper for us. I believe that God is the author of the Bible because Jesus proved Himself to be the Son of God and because He Himself says that the Bible is the Word of God. And someone might ask, well, still, didn't the Bible have human writers? Think of it this way. If I pick up a pen and I write you a letter, do you say that I wrote you a letter or do you say that a pen wrote you the letter? Of course, you say that I do. I was the author. And so God one day picked up a pen named Moses, and another day He picked up a pen named Peter, and another day He picked up a pen named Paul, and He wrote down His Word for us using these people. There's something this doesn't tell us, though. That is, who is God? What is His personality? Does He love us? How has He revealed Himself to us? Is He kind or is He mean? These are the questions that we'll explore in our next segment. Thank you for joining me today as you continue to seek God's will in His Word. Hello, my name is Lance Lake and I'm one of the elders of the West Main Church of Christ here in Medford, Oregon. We're located on the corner of Chestnut and West Main, which is one block west of Columbus Avenue. I'm inviting you to come and join us for worship on Sunday morning. Our start time is 10.15. We also have classes Sunday morning starting at 9 o'clock for all age groups. And we have classes on Wednesday night starting at 6.30 again for all age groups. You'll find that we're a very family-oriented congregation. Our youth group, 
which is for junior high and high schoolers, meets Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. And we do a lot of community projects throughout the year. We're always looking for new ways to serve our friends and neighbors in the greater Medford area. So please come and join us. I'm looking forward to meeting you. God bless you, and thank you so much for listening to us today. How do you see this old world? Oh, how do you soak it all in? Oh, where did you come from and why are you here? And what does it all really mean? Am I just here to make money? Or die in the vain quest for peace? How can I find out if there's truth in the world? Or shall I just live as I please? I've been told that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the only life worth living here today. I've been told that Jesus is the truth that all the world Things is the one who loves me so.